This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. So why do seagulls live near the sea? Because if they live near the bay, they'd be bagels. Welcome to Wings and Things, where you'll find real answers to real questions about everything you want to know about pet birds. Care, feeding, bird products, travel, and more. Everything to make your frequent flyer a happy camper. From parrots to parakeets, cockatiels to cockatoos, you'll have a bird's eye view of everything there is to know about your fun, feathered friends. So, spread your wings and get ready to fly on Wings and Things. Welcome to Wings and Things on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Robin Shawokas of the Leather Elves. Today, I'll be speaking with noted scientist, Dr. Irene Pepperberg, about her work um, on animal cognition and her new book, Alex and Me. We'll be right back after these messages. Sitting on a branch overlooking the parking lot, the pigeons watched as a Mercedes pulled in below them. What do you think, one bird said to the other. Should we put a deposit on that car? Stay perched. Wings and Things will be soaring back right after these messages. What if you could protect the life of your cat with something so simple and affordable that you already use every day? Get ready for the evolution of kitty litter. It's Pretty Litter. Along with all the features you've come to expect from your kitty litter, Pretty Litter's patented and scientific formula will also monitor your cat's health and detect illnesses early while providing industry-leading odor control. Two kitty litters, same cat, same price. But there's one important difference. Pretty Litter reacts to your cat's waste by detecting health issues simply by changing color. And the key is that Pretty Litter detects these issues before your cat shows symptoms of physical illness or pain, likely saving you major dollars in vet bills while protecting the health of your cat. What do you think, little guy? Ready to switch litter? Pretty Litter. Colorful insight into your cat's health. Go to prettylittercats.com forward slash cat 101 or use coupon code cat 101 to get 20% off your first subscription order. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. A Frenchman walks into a bar with a parrot on his shoulder. The bartender asks, where did you get that thing? The parrot replies, in France. There are millions of them. Don't have a canary. Wings and Things is back. Welcome back to Wings and Things on Pet Life Radio. Welcome, Dr. Pepperberg. Oh, thank you for having me here. Dr. Pepperberg is an adjunct associate professor at Brandeis University and a lecturer and researcher at Harvard. In her professional life, she's best known for her work on animal cognition, particularly in parrots. So, Dr. Pepperberg, you have this new book, Alex and Me. Can you tell us some some things about that? It's set up as a memoir. The science is all in the Alex studies. This is really a memoir of my life with Alex and the struggles that the two of us had in breaking down the preconceived notions about animal intelligence and particularly avian intelligence. Okay, thank you. I've read the book and, and it's wonderful. There are so many um, little stories and, and that are, are so incredibly meaningful to you. And one of the things that I took away from the book itself was a lot about relationships and and um you know i i mentioned uh, before we went on air that it it appeared that initially alex was a test subject you know in in, in the good sense of the word um and but it really he developed into a relationship with you we were always colleagues i mean that was you know from the get-go we were going to be colleagues on this and as the years go on, and you're working with this animal every day for multiple decades, mm-hmm. you know, the relationship grows, just like it would with any individual with whom you work on a daily basis. You start caring about them, sure. and that's inevitable. I always had to maintain a certain scientific objectivity, always had to draw some kind of barrier between us, because if I let my emotions start coloring the science, then the science was not going to be any good. So, as I said, I always treated him as a colleague. We were always you know, friends. We always worked together. I always appreciated the times when he didn't want to work, and you know, we worked around things like that. But it was after he died, and I realized there was not going to be any more science with him, that that barrier just came down, and I realized what I had been pushing aside right. for all those 30 years. And I think that, you know, with any colleague, and, and there is that 
when when you work with with animals of any type um, parrots in particular because you do get that response um, and, and it's a very clear response and I think there is that relationship and we talk so often in the parrot community with people about building relationships with their companion parrots and I think it's important that people think about the the void that you fill in these animals lives I talk a lot about uh, social enrichment and the way to, to kind of fill that, that niche for, for your animals. And it's really what you've done. Even though there was that colleague relationship, there was that underlying friendship, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are flock animals. If you've studied them in the wild at all, you realize a single bird is a dead bird. Right. It can't forage and look for predators. It can't preen and look for predators at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's always in a group of at least two birds. And usually in, with greys, it's usually about five birds at a time okay. that they're going around in their little flocks. Then they go into large flocks, say, for roosting at night. Sometimes my students found them in savans of a couple of hundred birds, you really? know, 20 to 100 birds, eating the clay and the greens that have very high mineral contents. Mm -hmm. So these are animals that are very used to being together. Right. And when you put a single bird in a cage, walk out the door at 8 a.m. and you don't come back till 7, 8, 7 p.m., you know, that this is not a healthy situation. Right. And I, you know, I tell people that too when I'm working, you know, with, with individuals on sometimes behavior issues, things like that, that they're facing in their homes. Um, I tell them, you know, I'm not encouraging people to go out and buy, you know, a flock of birds to keep in their home. That could be worse. In right, absolutely. And I, you know, and, but what I, and there, there's some stories in the book as well about um, Griffin and Alex when you initially introduced mm -hmm. them. They don't particularly care for one another. And after we got Arthur, then it was the enemy, my enemy is my friend. So they uh, became a little bit closer, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's something, you know, that, that speaks to the individuality of these animals, yeah. you know, yeah. and people say, well, I got another gray. They're, you know, they're both grays. They they should be friends. And I what what I always say to people is, you know, is every person that you meet on the street or in your work life, are they your friends? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, so th those are some things to be aware of. But the, you do bring home that point that they are flock animals. They do need that interaction. You know, whether it be from you, whether it be from people that are coming into your home. Yeah. Um, but it is so important. So... Um, you know, we you also there was a story um, in the book about uh, object permanence, um, and it, could you share that with us? Well, we had done a whole study on object permanence formally in the lab. Aside from that, and Alex came out the same level as young children, but this was a story where I had brought him home for the weekend, which I didn't do very often, but every once in a while, you know, we'd bring him home or bring him home during a holiday. And this time, he was very agitated. I couldn't figure out what was going on. He kept saying, you know, want to go back. And finally, I realized that out the window, there was a little nest of screech owls. Now, these are really tiny little owls. They're maybe, I don't know, four inches, mm -hmm. maybe five inches. And certainly, the babies are even tinier. And they had just begun to nest. And of course, I was so excited having these in the eaves of my, my porch. But I realized this is a predator for a parrot. You know, sure. even though he had never seen anything like that before, there's something hardwired there mm -hmm. about this predatorness. So I pulled down the shades and I explained to Alex, now you're inside and you're safe and they're outside and they're there and they're not going to get in. But, you know, windows and doors and things with birds, it's not something I understand. And he knew they were still there. Right. And he was not going to calm down. Mm -hmm. And it was just constantly, want to go back, want to go back. Which point I had to pack them up and take them back to the lab that night. Right. And and I think, you know, that's that's so important. And I, I talk to people as well about that awareness, that predator awareness. These whether are prey items. Right. The birds are prey prey animals and you know, the the parrots are and they don't even if they haven't ever seen I mean Alex had probably never seen a screech owl before or heard a screech owl. No. Um, yet it was that response was there. And I did a um I was up in upstate New York at a rehabilitation center and we had some parrots in a tent and they were all in, underneath the tent and you could see you know there was sunlight coming through but there weren't any windows on the roof of the tent and they did an owl release and the owls went over the tent and it was simply the silhouette of the owls every parrot in that tent went crazy you know there was alarm calls they were very agitated and it it none of them had ever seen an owl before but it was that that response and 
I um, mentioned to Dr. Pepperberg before we went on air that I have a device called an identifier and we use it for auditory enrichment because some stress is okay um, and I played it at a parrot seminar and played the out the bald eagle sound and none of those birds had ever been exposed to a bald eagle but there was an instant response yeah. you know so it's those are the kind of things that you want to think about um, from my point of view when you're doing enrichment when you're creating those opportunities what would these birds be doing were they in yeah. the wild that's interesting because even bald eagles are mostly you know fish Right, and things like that. But it's but still, still you know, it's that. still, yeah. uh, uh, and it may be the unknown, and it may right. be you know similar to some other bird, but right. but there is that that, that response, yeah, yeah and it, which is so interesting because they are wild by nature. Well, yeah. it's one generation. These birds are one generation from the savanne, the African savanne, or the you know Amazon rainforest. Right. Really, one one generation. And I and I try to you know talk to people about that too that. That you you know your bird is hopefully not wild caught you know right. we really hope that that's not the case, but its parents probably were right and you know you may have bought it from the most reputable um, breeder or store that you know of, and you've done your research, but it's still like you say that one generation away and that's so important to remember yeah, compared to dogs and cats that right. that have been you know domesticated for you know centuries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The uh, the object permanence is interesting to me too. Uh, my son, I was mentioning, did his uh, science fair project last year on raven versus dog. I mean, crow versus dog, and and the crow won hands down. And you know, I'm sure the parrots did did just as well I, when you did your studies in the lab. Um, and it's so interesting that that even if it's not there, oh, um, you know. can't see it. There, there's mm-hmm. still that. Yeah, yeah. that. We did the shell game with mm-hmm. the birds the way you do with the circuses. Sure. You know, and, mm, we just followed where it was. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's wonderful, and and just the level of intelligence. And I think you've made such so many good points, and really brought that to the forefront. That that intelligence and that that animal cognition that we we don't always think of. You know, we attribute the cute behaviors and the the mimicry, but we don't really look at it as that intelligence. Yeah, and it's it's amazingly they're amazingly smart. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're going to actually take a break here. And we will be right back after these messages. Stay perched. Wings and Things will be soaring back right after these messages. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations, and treat bowls, cups, and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash petlife. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. A Frenchman walks into a bar with a parrot on his shoulder. The bartender asks, where did you get that thing? The parrot replies, in France. There are millions of them. Don't have a canary. Wings and Things is back. Welcome back to Wings and Things on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Robin Shawokas, and I'm talking today with Dr. Irene Pepperberg. Um, Irene, if, do you have a favorite memory or story that you'd like to share? Well, there are two of them. I'll talk about the nut story because okay. that's, that's a real fun one. Um, we were at the Media Lab at MIT and this is a separate entity at MIT that's mostly corporate funded. And twice a year we would have a show and tell for all these corporations that were giving us tons and tons of money to develop cutting edge materials for them. And this was the year that I brought Alex and Griffin to MIT and word had gotten out that there was these live birds and so all these CEOs wanted to see Alex and one group came through and they wanted to look at our phoneme work. Now this was basically something we had been working on for maybe about a year part-time because we were doing lots of different studies with Alex and it involved refrigerator letters, the kind you give children, on a tray and we're having Alex sound them out 
and the goal was to see if he understood that his labels were made up of these individual bits of sound that could be recombined to make up new labels. Okay. Just like little kids learn their phonics, mm -hmm. you know, phonetics and stuff. So that's what these they wanted to see. Whatever, I don't know why, but that's what they wanted to see. So we set the tray up, and I only have these guys here for, you know, five minutes, seven minutes, because they have to visit everybody in the lab. So we started up, and I'm asking Alice, you know, so what sound is blue? And he goes, I say, good birdie. And he goes, want a nut. A reward because by this time those little le letters were no longer fun to chew. Right. So I'm going no 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 because I'm thinking oh my gosh he's going to sit there for you know a minute chewing a nut I only have five minutes we've got to go through this so I say wait so we go through another you know what color is or yellow good birdie want a nut and I say no 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 wait so we go through about four or five of these and each time he gets a little more emphatic about wanting his nuts and I'm just saying just wait just wait and finally after the you know fifth time he looks at me he goes want a nut n uh, t. Well, you know, at one level, it's, you know, do I have to spell it for you, stupid? But the really amazing thing about this was that n and t had been trained, but uh had never been trained. Uh -huh. So he had flipped ahead of us, realizing it's n, uh, t. That's right. I say nut. And he had gone beyond where we thought he was in the training. Oh, that's exciting. And, you know, my, my one of my real regrets is that we didn't pursue that because we were doing so many other things at the time because mm -hmm. I'm sure it would have really been exciting. And just before he died, we had more evidence for that. So when he was learning wool, um, when he was learning spool, he started by saying s with a space, wool, and the space was for that difficult p sound. Okay. Whereas normally when he would learn labels early on, he would have started with the vowel. Because that's more parody, whistly. Right. But here he put two things together that he already knew, s and wool, that were the closest things. And then when he figured out how to do the sp sound, which is really hard without lips, mm -hmm. then we got spool. That okay. sounded just like mine. And he was learning seven. It was started with s space for that v again with the lips, one. And then he went to snun. Which sounds weird, but think about it. one, seven, none. Right. And that's how he's doing it. Just before he died, he started saying seven. Uh, now, you bring up an interesting point, the, the similarities between human speech and parrot speech. Um, is you, know, you, there's, you did some, some work on that and with yeah. um, the different sounds and the way um, the parrot's body Producing. makes the sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they were very similar. Am I correct? With Alex, they were very similar. With our youngest bird, Arthur, he took a shortcut, so he'd go swoop, and it was a whistle. Uh -huh. And when you you know graph it, there's a machine that graphs frequency versus time, a sonograph. You could see the whistle that he used, but Alex did spool. He figured out how to use esophageal speech to make that p sound, and there it was. And it looked. I mean, you you. Do it on the sonograph. It's a slightly different frequency than mine, but mm -hmm. all the aspects of it okay. are the same. Now, is this typical to grays, or have you done it? Grays are really good at this. Okay. Um, we haven't looked at a whole lot of other birds. One of my students looked at her Amazon and saw it wasn't nearly as close. Grays seem to have a musculature and an ability that's a little bit different okay. from some of the other parrots. So and that's physiologically, why, yeah. they're a little different. Physiologically, then. they're a little different, and at, anatomically, a little different. And they really do sound freaky, right? Like, like right. humans. Well, I, and I think too, with as far as the mimicry piece is concerned, with grays, you find that they sound exactly like whatever they're mimicking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, when you do the analyses, yeah, yeah, it's a little higher pitch because their little body, you know, sure. can't get the lower pitches as well. But it is amazing. I mean, we have stories of friends of mine who, you know. The, the people come in the house and they say, oh, you know, hi, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. No, 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 it's me and the bird, you know. Right. Well, I, I was on the phone once with a, a friend who's in Florida, and she had an African gray. And I heard this sound, and I said, oh, are you doing construction on the house? And she said, no, it's Sebastian. <laughs> it sounded just like a nail gun. It was absolutely, you know, I would have sworn that someone was using a nail yeah. gun in her house. But no, it was Sebastian. Um, so, yeah, they they are... Wonderful at that, but the the speech patterns is interesting that yeah. that they're so very close. Yeah. Um, it might be interesting to see if if other species as well. You say that the Amazon was not as close, right. um, but that that's an interesting thought. Now there was a quote in the book um, about 
the, that you were thinking about that they're thinking conscious creatures not human thinking not human thinking and not human consciousness and I think that's important um, and I if could you elaborate a little well, bit they are their own individual beings they have an evolutionary niche evolutionary pressures are somewhat similar to but somewhat different from ours mm -hmm. and that's how they respond we can't always expect them to respond the same way we do a lot of what I do is giving them tests that are given to young children which is important because it helps us understand them better but in a sense it's very unfair because those are tests designed for humans right. with what humans need to know to survive in the world which is not necessarily exactly the same what parrots need to know to survive in the world. Mm -hmm. And it becomes more you know, amazing when you look at like their color vision. They see in the ultraviolet. So we had to use, you know, have this bottle of purple paint and another bottle of non-toxic, you know, orange paint because Alex would see orange and he'd see what we would call orange. He might want to call rose, which is his label for red or yellow. I mean, he had a much different spectrum mm -hmm. of this. But we had to agree that, you know, this was going to be orange right and again it was you know what did he really see we were just starting a project on optical illusions to determine literally how did he see the world oh, so, how exciting that yeah. I and mean, that's it's interesting I tell you know I've talked to um, people with color blindness and I'll say well how do you know that this is red or how do you well that's what I've been taught all my life and I think we need to consider that in working with parrots, that yeah. we are demonstrating, like you say, this is orange. And you come to, okay, this is what orange is going to be. In our, you know, communication system. Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. For what, for these purposes, this right. is what we're calling orange. Right. And, and I think that's, you know, we do consider, we expect those human responses. And, you know, I, I say to people, well, you're, you're expecting something from an animal that, that may not need that response in any way, shape, or form. Right, exactly. You know? And it's and we need to be considerate of that. Right. And I think, too, you also said um, in the book um, that they're their own beings. Right, for exactly the same reason. I yeah. mean, they are what they are. I mean, I have friends who have, you know, cockatoos. And, you know, cockatoos do their morning and their evening screams. Thank you so much <laughs> for saying that. I mean, that's what they do. And, and you really, you know, you can argue that you can keep the animal quiet during the day and try to, you know, train away from them screaming all day, mm -hmm. which is fine, but those morning and evening screams, I mean, that's that's the greeting calls. We made it through the night. Right. Or it's, you know, it's, it's their flock call in the evening. You know, we're all going to get together and roost together. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, as an animal that's only one generation out of that, that rainforest, that's something that's going to be there. And if you're going to have one of these birds, you have to recognize that that's part of their their lives right and, one and of the, one of my favorite um, quotes is is about how if you're going to own a cockatoo in particular you need to be aware of what their characteristics are and and live with those characteristics not try to change them yeah yeah I mean again you know the screaming all day no that's not normal yeah. and you can can train that out but right. they have to have their, that sometime because it's mm -hmm. And when you look at these birds in the wild, too, they are not screaming all day. No. They're, you know, in fact, sometimes when they're foraging, you know, in they the canopy, they're quiet, silent. Of course, they don't want to attract predators. Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, well, my bird screams all day. Well, okay, that's not acceptable. Right. But like you say, the morning and evening and giving that bird that time, giving them that modicum of control. Yes. You yeah. know, is yeah. so important. I mean, when we, when we think about what we've taken away right oh yeah you know whether it be that one generation or right. not yeah. what we've taken away by putting them in a cage or putting them in a house for that right. matter right well um, you know i have a friend who has a very stressful job and she has a cockatoo and she says well i come home in the evening and we have our screaming fit together she says it's wonderful i have had this stressful day and i just start screaming the birds start screaming and we get it all over within you know five ten minutes and we both feel better right and right. And, and, it, and it's so true you know and and i i like to talk about um really allowing for that that naturalistic behavior you know and and encouraging it you know whether you do it you know you yeah. do this come right. home and, 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 and the bird knows you know she, it waits for her to come home and they have their screaming fit together and then it's all done right right and I'm now she doesn't have any issues with the bird when during the day or you no know, it's yeah yeah it's just you know the, the bird has learned that we're going to have this time together and yeah. yeah I have a question for you because this is one of my um one of my big questions as far as enrichment's concerned, olfactory um, sensation in parrots. 
Probably about the same as ours, okay? okay? Um, you know, we, we never studied it formally with Alex. There was one time that one of my students came in with a, um, a smoothie, very strongly scented smoothie. It was a strawberry something, whatever, but, and Alex starts going, want banana, want banana. And we kept giving him banana and get thrown it on the floor. And finally I said, give him a sip of that thing. And she looks at me and I said, you don't have to share it with him. Just, you know, right. take it out and give him it. So he tasted it. He didn't like it. But he stopped saying, want banana. And it was it was so strongly scented. And mm-hmm. he didn't have many fruit flavors at the time, labels at the time. Okay. So we, you know, we figured, oh, it probably was about the same as ours. I mean, these birds, you know, in the wild, they're in these rainforests. I don't think they use scent to, you know, figure out something for big distances away. Right. But they probably use it to determine, say, quality of ripeness. Mm-hmm. You know, once they get to the tree to decide if this is going to be, you know, of a good fruit to eat as opposed to the one, another fruit or something like that. Okay. So they have some olfactory sense, but it's not like dogs. Right, right. Or and, something. you know, because I've, I've had people say, oh, I don't bother to do any olfactory enrichment because their receptors are so small. Yeah, there's there's some there. Again, it's 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 we our olfactory receptors are really crummy compared right. to like a, you know dogs or other animals, some other animals. Mm-hmm. So I think theirs are probably about the same as ours. Right, and I the other thing too that that I you know think of is that with Amazons in particular comes to mind because they perfume that scent. It's there, you know, and, and I've had so many people say to me, I love the way my Amazon smells, you know, or I love that Amazon smell. And my feeling, my gut reaction is there wouldn't be that scent for no reason. Right, right. You know. Yeah, it means something. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Maybe maybe down the road um, <laughs> you could do some, some olfactory studies. And um, so that's, you know, I think that's kind of interesting. And I always tell people, try it, you know, um, don't overwhelm them with scent. Of course not, because um, you have to be careful because some stuff is dangerous. Right, exactly. And, and you know, but you know, some, some light sense, things like that, it's worth a try. And, and maybe it'll be enriching and, and maybe it won't, but you know, why just kind of discount it um, completely? So, so anything else that, that you'd like to share with us? Uh, yes, because I want people to understand a little bit more about why we do the work. Sure. Um, there are three main reasons. One is of course to determine, you know, how smart these birds are. The brain is walnut sized mm-hmm. and yet they do what we do because of it's a brain body weight issue. So I want to see how far we can go in that. Um, second is the conservation issue. People tend to conserve what's most like them. Right. And so the idea is that if we can explain to people how smart these birds really are, there will be some impetus mm-hmm. to save their habitat, to avoid you know, getting poached, birds that are poached, things like that. And the third one is we actually do use these as models for human intervention systems. So my colleague Diane Sherman in Monterey has adapted our techniques for work with children with di- communicative disabilities, particularly autism. Mm-hmm. And so when people say, oh, well, you know, what's the big point of our spending, you know, government money to support you, or why should we donate money to help you? It's just a bird. I say, well, it has these other consequences sure. that are really quite interesting, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll bear some fruit. I think the human applications are so huge, though. I, In my prior life, I worked with individuals with disabilities. Oh, so so I, in so much, you know, carries over and and I think it's it's so important that we do recognize that you know they are these beautiful flighted wonderful creatures but at the same time there's so much we can learn from them and yeah. and about them that we can apply um, to our yeah. to our own circumstances and the conservation piece I, I can't say enough you know that that we do need to be aware of what we're doing to habitats and and you know the way the wild caught birds had for so many years you know and and it's and i don't want to be naive or have our listeners be naive that it's not still happening oh yeah i mean we just about a year ago i got a um email from a friend of mine who's actually a gorilla person but she's in contact with the people in africa who sent her an email saying we've just confiscated you know a couple of hundred grays that were going to be shipped out and now you know they needed help in building cages for these birds. Some of them were ill and needed veterinary care and things. And so I helped put people together, uh-huh. you know, just, I didn't, I personally couldn't do anything. I wasn't going to try to spearhead any, you know, big donation thing, but I connected people who connected people who could donate, you know, drugs and this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, this was 
just a year ago. Right. A couple so, hundred grays that were being smuggled out. Yeah, and I and I think we sometimes, you know, the parrot community sticks its head, you know, under the blanket and says, Oh no, it's not you know, there there are bands, there are yeah, yeah, people are not yeah. wild, you know, catching wild anymore. Catching. And it's happening and I mean, even when you think about even animals that are domestically bred, you know, again people you know, ask me, oh, I, you know, I'd really love to have a parrot. And I say, so what's your lifestyle? Right. These birds forage 60 kilometers a day in the wild. They are always with other birds. I say, if you work at home, can you take your bird to work with you? Um, if you're going to tell me that you're going to leave it alone all day, I'm going to say, get a budgie. They're yeah. wonderful, wonderful pets. You can get a cage big enough for a budgie that won't take up your whole living room, and yet the bird can still fly from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. You can fill it with enough toys to keep it happy. And when you come home, this budgie's going to be happy to see you. Um, larger birds, it's very hard. I know people who successfully manage this. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to have a large bird and to have a lifestyle that keeps you out of your house for right. huge amounts of time. And I think people do run into that whole guilt thing as well. You know, yeah. they get themselves a larger parrot and I'm not able to spend enough time. So then it turned into, well, I'll just give them, you know, more toys. I'll just throw yeah. more toys in the cage. And, and they're not really thinking through why they're putting those toys in. What's the purpose? Um, you know, why are, you know, or they end up with behavioral issues. Yeah. Well, because these birds are, you know, not terribly happy. I right. mean, again, I, I know people who have managed with oh, sure. really, really large enough cages that the birds can really stretch out and spread their wings, you know, completely spread their wings within the cages, and there are enough toys in there, but the bird, there aren't so many toys that the birds can't, you know, stretch out and things like right. that. And, and they know to change the toys all the time mm -hmm. and, and give them particularly toys that are foraging toys so that the birds have to work at it right. and, and get be challenged somewhat by Let it. Let me ask because. you a question about that too because I recently had this this epiphany if you will about foraging. Um, we I definitely encourage people to to provide foraging activities. But as far as the big multi step, you have to pull the draw, mm -hmm. step on the lever, do this, do that, mm -hmm. do this, do that, do this for an almond. What do you think? Depends on the bird. Okay. You know, some birds really get into this. Right. Other birds get frustrated. Mm -hmm. You know, look at your bird. Find out what, you know, you, you can watch your bird do this and see. Sure. Are they getting frustrated and angry or are they having fun at it? Right. And, you know, the, the same species, you're going to have variations. Yeah. And I, I think, and that's an important point too, is I used to years ago say, okay, this is a toy for an African gray. This is a toy for a blue and gold. And I, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. You know, because they are so different. And, and the way I liken it and, and try to get people to think about it is, you know, we're all humans, but I may not like the same food you like. Right. I may not like the same activities. Right, exactly. But nobody thinks that's strange, you right. know. Yeah. But you can't, we really have to look at the birds as individuals. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Griffin simply, he likes just things that he can chew apart. And he really likes paper to mm -hmm. chew. He doesn't like to chew wood for whatever reason. He just likes to chew paper. So we, very simple toy, we take a PC. PVC tube, we fill it with rolled up construction paper and we fan the ends. Mm -hmm. And he has a ball yeah. tearing that apart. You give him a wooden toy, he looks at it like, that's going to kill me, it's going to eat me, I don't want it. <laughs> There's this giant thing in my yes. cage, what are you doing? Arthur, the younger bird, you know, there is not a toy in this world that this bird doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And he just, everything you put in his cage, he really enjoys and he's happy with them. So, you know, these are, these are both grays. Mm -hmm. Alex wouldn't touch any toy. Okay. He was just, you know, excuse me. The only thing, he, he would excavate boxes. Uh. But that was about it. It was like he wanted to interact with us. He wanted to solve mental problems. Mm -hmm. You know, this was, Alex was a very different bird. So his, what what was, what, what turned Alex on was people. Yeah, was the yeah. interaction with yeah. people. And Griffin's and, much sim more similar to, yeah. to Alex than, than to Arthur. That's interesting. And yeah. they, they are so very different. And I think, you know, I, I liken it to a big triangle. You know, you start out with the species at the top, yeah. an inverted triangle, and then you bring it down to, you know, the, where they came from, the particular flock or whatever, yeah. and then you bring it down to your individual bird. And for my purposes, that's how you create yeah. opportunities for them. And you, you figure out what that bird likes. Right, yeah. right. Um, all right, well, anything else you, you need in closing? or yeah, Just that people should really enjoy their birds. I mean, I get people coming to me saying, well, you know, my bird doesn't talk. And I'm going, so what? Right. You know, each bird is an individual. Enjoy the bird for what, who, what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
don't don't expect them. You know, people say, well, well, you know, Alex did this, and I say, Alex had an army, a small army of students, and and you know me. Somebody was with him eight to ten hours a day, talking with him, interacting with him, not always training him, mm -hmm. but treating him like a toddler. You know, when we gave him his food, you know, we went, oh, corn. Okay, here's your corn. It's yellow corn. The color is yellow. You know, right. it's cold. It just came from the fridge. You know, we talk to him that way. Not everybody can do that with mm -hmm. their bird. Sure. And that's what made Alex special, and people need to realize that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, and welcome. I think that's really good advice for people that, you know, look at them for the beautiful thing, th creature thing that they are. Yeah. And then, you know, whatever the setting. Beautiful individual. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, build a relationship with that animal that's in your home um, and really yeah. have that, that be um, an individual kind of relationship. So, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And I have some upcoming events I need to discuss. On December 6th, I'll be doing um, at the New England Wildlife Center in Weymouth, Massachusetts, a holiday toy making workshop. You can call the center to register for that. January 23rd to the 25th, I'll be at Parrot Festival in Houston. I'll have a booth, so come by and say hi. On February 21st, um, Barbara Heidenreich and I will be speaking at the Cincinnati Bird Club. On February 22nd, I'll be at Cleveland Peace um, speaking with them. February 24th through the 28th is the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. Um, on March 14th, Barbara will be in Dallas uh, doing a workshop at, for bird at Bird Haven. You can check out birdhaven.org. It's actually bird um, underscore haven.org. In March, Barbara will also be in Finland, France, and Portugal, and you can get more details on that at goodbirdinc.com. Um, on March 28th, Barbara's going to be at Featherless Farms in Old Sabre, Connecticut, doing a flight training seminar. In May, I know it's a ways off, but it's right it's really right around the corner. We're doing the best, um, best conference in Edison, New Jersey, from the 29th to the 31st. And then for those of you that plan way out, um, October 24th to the 31st, I'll be on the Parrot Lovers Cruise, and you can find out more about that at parrotloverscruise.com. Some websites for you to visit, um, goodbirdinc.com, theleatherelves.com, bestparrotconference.com, parrotloverscruise.com, and alexfoundation.org. And some recommended products for you. Um, as I mentioned, I just finished reading Alex and Me, and it's wonderful. And the Alex Studies as well. And my enrichment tip for the week is many times uh, teaching and training opportunities are in themselves enriching. And you can use those interactions to really fill in that social need um, for your parent. And so I guess, you know, we're out of time, but I'd like to thank um, my guest, Dr. Irene Pepperberg. Thanks, Irene. And as always, we're working on some new topics um, and bringing you some fun and informative guests that are from the parrot community. If you have suggestions or questions, um, you can contact us at robin at petliferadio.com or barbara at petliferadio.com. And if you'd like transcripts of the show, please visit www.petliferadio.com. So take care and bye-bye. Join us every week on Wings and Things and get a bird's eye view of everything there is to know about pet birds and how to make your frequent flyer a happy camper. Wings and Things, only on petliferadio.com.